Paula Corsier, if anybody needs to <laughs> What's that? I don't know. <laughs> 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 All right, everybody knows. Um, that, but the, uh, let me hit the key components because it's relevant to the manufacturing process. Uh, the key components, um, you have the, the generating unit and then the home kit. So this is the key components of the generating unit. There is very little to these units. Four deep cycle batteries, one primary charge controller, 20 uh, MPPT battery chargers, a great connection unit, uh, next tech supplies, and then uh, six 240 watt PV panels. From an uh, electrical standpoint, that's it. It's wiring harnesses and stuff, but that's functionally all this computer does. Uh, from a hardware standpoint, you've got the panel backing system, the trailer assembly itself, and then there's a series of stabilizers to keep the unit level. But it's a very, very elegantly simple machine. Built like a tank. Built like a tank. <laughs> um, the home kits basically functionally are comprised of two primary movers, the box itself and the lighting, the lighting kits. The home battery kit, um, 18 amp hour battery inside, a low voltage disconnect switch to prevent the battery from being discharged beyond 50%. There's two DC outlets on the side of it, the voltmeter, and the light. That's it. Not a whole lot to it. The lighting kits are absurdly simple. Literally, with 11 minutes and 15 minutes, you can make one. Uh, you've got the two LED bulbs, two bases, and 30 feet of wiring, and then a DC plug in the back. The DC plug, when you buy these things out of China, to give you an idea of what costs are, the DC plug costs about a quarter. These units cost about 20 cents each. Um, these units are actually so cheap, I can't order a thousand at a time. I have to order like 5,000 of them to make it worth their time, and the wiring is ridiculously cheap. Nothing here is complicated. These things, like I said, 11 minutes and 15 minutes you can assemble. This kit itself is much more time consuming, but the only thing really challenging in it is the LVD, the low voltage disconnect switch and the wiring associated with that. That's tedious, but not hard. Is that, can I ask a question? Oh, how did you determine that it should be set at 50%? That would be the actual belief. Is that, is that standard, or yeah. could you go to 25%? No. You damage the battery when you go to low. When you go below, the battery cannot come back to life. It'll change the lifetime curve, and if you do at eighty percent, you're probably better. Yeah, or both. Probably so. Fifty is a pretty standard number, and the big the big batteries are handled the same way. The master controller here does a fifty fifty percent limit on those. So far, as far as the main, the, the main trailer, with the interconnection unit, you don't really need that if you're going to be like a tie into your engine. You don't. Yeah. You don't need the, the uh, connection unit um, physically if you are not going to tie it to anything. This is absolutely This correct. is just part of the current design that we, in case it's a backup, you need to charge the trailer. The, the tr that device uh, has more political value than um, from, a, from a pitch standpoint and a presentation standpoint, there's a lot of people who ask about diesel generators, wind, so wind resources, and great, great time. So the fact that it's there allows us to say, yes, we can do all those things. From a government relationship standpoint, though, it's really important because the fact that we can tie to the grid if the grid shows up, well, the, the, you know, when the utility is like, well, you're, are you competing with us? We're like, no. You know, first off, you're not there. Second off, if you do get there and you want us to leave, we can leave. Third off, this thing tied, can be tied to the grid and give you some level of voltage support. So it actually has a lot of value politically, even beyond technically. I'm just thinking, you know, if we design it as an optional unit, right, it's available, but I don't want to incur my costs of deployment so I can deploy more units. Right, right. It would just become, if the, I like I like having it there. Uh, the ability to tie in a generator is, is really nice um, for things like it made it obvious and easy to do the UNEP end of grid application. Like it's already set up to do that, and it's one of the accounts. So there there's just a lot of value in having it. The cost is you know it's like a you know, I think the price that Next Tech is giving us on is like five hundred bucks or something like that. So 
it's not it's not a quarry price, right? Plus they donated all the stuff. The first ones were all donated, yeah. So uh, and they built the stuff, so we were happy to accept the donation. But uh, some people argued early about throwing it out. That's what's there. But the battery is. Uh, the, the battery, how much of it do you uh, actually assemble or do you have to like, assemble a giant industry? Well, we'll come to that. That's, that's actually, that was actually the biggest, one of the biggest issues we had to deal with. Um, and a lot of it came out of the lessons from the original design. When we did the first six units, what we found out was essentially the base electrical design to this was excellent. It was ridiculously easy to use. It was very robust. It did exactly what we wanted it to do. So the basic electrical design was fantastic. The racking system that we designed was really designed for extreme mobility and extremely easy to blend. Literally, you roll this thing in, you pull out four drawers, you're done. Um, turned out that racking system was extremely expensive to make and extremely complicated to make um, and very heavy. So the racking system, ultimately, while we were happy with it for what it was and for the first units, um, as a, at scale, we're designing a new one. Um, then the trailer unit was the other challenge. Um, we, the trailer was a fantastic concept because we're like, this is perfect. They roll off the assembly line, hook them up to a truck, you drive it to where you're going, you unflop it, you're done, you pull off the drawers, perfect. And that was the vision. We're like, Make this thing easy to deploy. Do the work in the factory, put it in the field, set it up in 20 and 30 minutes and you're out. The uh, problem was the trailers that we had made, we thought were going to be robust enough. They weren't even close. The, the ones that came, the company supplied us with these trailers um, with a 26 GVW rating. When the things came in at 3200, that was a problem. So they had to upgrade all the suspension. Um, you had a tongue weight issue, you know, the tongue weight on the trailer by the engineers had a great design, great work balancing the weight, so there was 200 pounds of tongue weight. Fantastic. Look up a geo tractor to tow this thing. As long as you don't hit a bump. As soon as you hit that bump, you have the weight shifts, the tongue weight goes through the roof, the geo tracker's nose pops up, and the tongue is only designed to carry a certain amount of tongue weight and it bends. Then we also we drove this thing through. This you can't see it real clearly here, but this is a road that's not a road, it's a creek bed. We drove, when we drove this thing hooked up to the back of a Land Rover, by the time we got to the destination, the tongue was twisted like a pretzel. It was just, it was literally, I was looking at some well, that's not going anywhere. That's it. Um, then, so the trailer itself, as durable as we thought it was, was, was inadequate as it was. It was already too expensive. And then on top of it, half the roads go through rivers. I can't build a trailer big enough, robust enough to handle all of this stuff. And then leave it there. Because basically the trailer just drops right there, you deploy it, and you leave, and you leave the trailer there. So that's a lot of money you spent to integrate the trailer with the rest of the stuff. So we need to move away from that um, so, going forward. So the option is just laying on a flatbed Hiring a flatbed in country. Yeah, we're looking at two options right now. Um, the core philosophy is it needs to be able to be loaded on whatever is available. If that's a flatbed, if that's a pickup truck, if that's a trailer, um, we want to go into it. Yeah, because basically, in developing countries, you work with what you got, and you don't want to have some. You don't have to have, to have some customized piece of machinery to get the job. Right. But we are also looking at, at having a customized trailer that just makes it easy. So, if, you know, for a lot of applications, if we know we can get it there, have a custom trailer that's just designed to make it easy to deploy. You really need it. I think you're going to need a custom something because you've got to manipulate that thing into some pretty cut off of places backwards from the well, we're, totally <clears throat> A lot of things we run into, it's like even if you, you drive it to the end of the road, right? But the end of the road is still 100 yards from where they're setting it up. Yeah. And, you know, remember on Savo, <laughs> literally the road ended, and then there's just a foot trail going down the base of this hill, it was a super steep hill, and the unit was actually located, you know, 20 feet up this hill, and we're just like, how the heck did they get that unit from the end of the road there? And 
And more and more that's becoming an issue where you're just like, you need to be able to move this thing uh, what, and with the resources you have. What do you have? People. Uh, you saw the video earlier today with like the 10 Haitian guys pushing this thing up onto the back of a flatbed. One of the things we're looking at for our next design is, is basically modifying the shape and carryability of this thing. So basically, you could have four or six people just pick it up like a coffin and, and carry it to where it's going. Uh, people are generally easy to find, whereas in America, you can't find six people to do something. You need a forklift and a driver. The home kits, again, the base electrical design was, was great. The LEDs, we had, I had half a dozen people tell me, get rid of the low voltage disconnect. So at the time, the first ones were $25 a pop for a $5 chip. You know, um, we were paying $25 each, and the batteries only cost me 20 So why are you paying as much or more for this LED when you can just buy the batteries? And I'm like, look at it. First off, I got the cost of replacing the battery. You know, it's not just the cost of the battery. You've got to get the battery. You've got to get the home kit. You've got to have the guys swap out the battery. Then you've got a waste product that you've got to properly deal with. Beyond that, the $25 LBD, which is this one down here, I'm like, there's no way in heck I'm paying 25 bucks for a freaking chip. And this is a circuit board that we made in China, and I can buy them for five bucks. I'm sure of it. Um, that's going to come up on the strategic relationships with the manufacturers. So this was extremely good. The LED was extremely expensive, which is a big problem. And then the internal wiring of it was a bit of a challenge. It's not technically difficult, but it's very tedious and time consuming. Uh, so we knew that that was going to be a problem long term. It's going to be really hard. If you're deploying 10 of these 10 generating units, that's 830 home kits that all have to be screwed together by hand, just as tedious work. Uh, when we got into the manufacturing phase, which is kind of where we're at now, making these design decisions, um, the battery kit, assembling the battery kit, was going to require a lot of technical training of uh, people soldering, um, you know, dealing with chips or circuit boards, uh, a lot of quality control issues. That was going to be a challenge. The cost of shipping the components, if I bought the battery, the box, the uh, low voltage disconnect, the wiring, and shipped them all to Haiti, that was going to cost me more than just having the comp the whole thing, components bought in Haiti, assembled, or bought in China, assembled in China, and then shipped to Haiti. So it's actually just cheaper to get it done in China. The, um, Integrated parts could actually be bought for less than the individual components. So when you're dealing with the Chinese manufacturers, they're like, look, just, we'll just put it all together for you, and it's going to cost you less than it would cost you if you go source the parts individually, even at scale. So basically, at the end of the day, for the home kits, importing the completely manufactured units lowered the overall cost in every permutation. The generating units were a different, different issue. Um, we felt we believe we could leverage the existing skills to assemble these things. It's turning screws, it's turning a wrench, it's drilling holes, it's doing some basic metal fabrication. These are skills that are available in almost every developing country. So they were there. It was trainable, whereas the home kits were much more challenging. The cost of shipping the components is actually lower than the cost to ship completed units. Completed unit, you're only going to get three to five into a cargo container, depending on the on how it's laid out. But I can buy, and then you've got to spend, you know, seven or eight thousand dollars to ship that container. I can buy a container's worth of solar panels and ship them to Haiti. Buy a container's worth of batteries, charge controllers, all the components, buy them in bulk, buy the container, ship them to Haiti, and have local people assemble it and lower my overall cost. It will be more expensive to have them manufactured somewhere else and then ship. So as a result, local assembly of uh, imported, imported components lowered the overall cost here. And these drivers here are not altruistic. I'm not sitting here trying to make the best decision for the community. Um, I'm sitting here on what works. Um, and 
you know, so one of the questions came up, it's like, well, what do you do if China starts making these sun laser units? And like, look at, from the home kit side, I'm already buying them as cheap as anybody can get made in China. From the generating units, units side, I'm using develop, labor in developing countries, which is every bit as inexpensive as China. And I can beat the Chinese manufacturing rates because my shipping costs are lower. So those home kits are used extensively in China? No. It's a, it's a jumper kit. I mean, that's just a box. You buy one of these at, at a Home Depot or Craig and Auto Parts. But the internal electronics are completely different. So <coughs> what actually happened to us with the home kits, <coughs> they were one of the tsunamis that was coming. You know, I knew that as soon as we had to do 10 units, Wayne in Long Island was not going to assemble 830 home kits functioning for free. Um, and kind of when we were aware of this issue, but hadn't really, it hadn't become a problem yet, this company saw an article about us in World Magazine. Uh, one of the World Magazine reporters went out to Haiti, saw what we were doing, took pictures, interviewed people, wrote a fantastic article about this. And, um, that's a real Christian magazine, for those who don't know. Um, yeah, oh, I'll send it to you. Yeah, and um, so this Christian magazine publishes this fantastic story about us. Wagon um, calls me up, and they're based in Hayward. And they're like, we saw your article in World Magazine, so we want to know what we can do to help you. And, and we're like, I get these calls. We get these calls every month, at least, you know, probably every week. Somebody says, how can we help you? This looks really cool. And while well, everybody's heart is in the right place, a lot of times their actions don't match up. So I go out to see Wagon, and I'm sitting in a little tiny conference room, probably about kind of a six feet by six feet. And we're chatting about the overall project, and, and they're like, all right, well, why don't we kind of take you back to our main conference room, and we'll see what we can do for you. I walk to their main conference room, and it's a room about twice as long as this, and the whole back is filled with DC power supply jump kits, inverters, DC charges, DC coolers. It's like, it was a candy store. And I was just like, I looked at this and I'm like, and I actually saw something very similar to the jumper kit that we were using on their shelf. And I'm like, I need that with a low voltage disconnect switch and the internal rest of the internal wiring to get it. Um, I was ecstatic. And I gave them the wiring diagram and the specifications. And, um, and that was it, I kind of left. And about four weeks later, they called me up. So, you want to come out and see the sample? I'm like, what? Because you mean these guys on their own, because they just they believed in the vision of what we were doing. They're like, we're going to take it on our own dime to do the redesign, to design the LVD, find the manufacturers for it, make sure you know, to have our suppliers be able to tool to produce these things so they are exactly what you need off at the end of the factory and they gave us a sale, uh, totally on their own dime. <laughs> and then we're like, this is great. And we weren't really too worried about it because we figured we still had several months to kind of finalize some stuff. And then we had issues with our current supply of units and we called them up and we're like, we need uh, 1,500 of those right now. <laughs> and 400 on an airplane. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. um, but they're aligned with the vision, you know, and it's not just altruistic. They, this is their core business is making DC power devices. So they're going to benefit from this. They're not losing money on any one of these things, but there's a unity that they want to do this from a spiritual standpoint. They want to do this to make sense from a business standpoint. Um, and unity is everything. Tell them about the solar spaces. Uh, the cubes? Tell it. Uh, they also donated to us, it was initially going to be three, and it ended up being 24 solar cubes um, that I'm going to have uh, a contest to be for entrepreneurial plans so that we can also help some people who want to do something sustainable take their the best of their ideas and make it sustainable and, and put the cube in their use to, to develop the their cube the, the cube is basically the, say, uh, uh, the sun laser at a 25% scale. Oh. Um, it must be shaped like a cube. It, it, <laughs> it, 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 it rolls. It's like a, like you pull the handle up, it's like a suitcase. Yeah. yeah. Very heavy suitcase. <laughs> no photo of it. 
we'll take you to the wagon site. So, yeah. um, so we got into the redesign issues. That was the redesign for the home kids, was wagons stepping up and just doing this. And that we were real confident in the design, didn't need to do anything. Uh, the generating units were a bigger issue. Revising the, uh, we needed to revise the internal electrical layout just to make it easier to install. The original design, while fantastic in many respects, was just complicated. It worked great for the engineers in Long Island, but the engineers in Long Island were the ones that kept telling me, you need to make changes to do this in Haiti. It's, it's got to simplify. But that's not a big deal. Redesigning the bracket system is, is undergoing right now. Again, it's not a big deal. And then simplifying the containment unit. All of these, though, are targeted at making sure we have a low cost, local assembly of generating units. That's the core thing, just driving those costs as far down as we can. And leveraging local manufacturers and local personnel to do that. It is, you know, here on the generating units, we, we are better off with local manufacturing and the people are better off. So, again, there's unity. Um, you have to build the logistics and supply chains for the generating unit components, the batteries, and the lighting kits. This I've got a slide on later, but that's, that's a big deal. And then the last piece is minimize the fully loaded cost of deploying the units to the franchisees. It's not, <coughs> it's not just about the component cost, because if you just add up the cost of the components, you can say, well, I just buy the components and I don't have the trailer and all this other stuff, I can put solar on somebody's roof for less money from a component standpoint. That's absolutely true. But I need a team of two to three guys to go out and install those panels on somebody's roof. It's going to take them a day to two days to do it. If I want to do 100 youth homes a month, I'm going to need like 500 guys out in the field, or you know, it's like 20 different teams of installing people. Um, the, you know, trained installation people. A nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and there's other issues because you can't remove it. But you just, you know, when you get the fully loaded cost and time to deploy, installing it one by one on people's homes doesn't work. You know, the home itself may not even be capable of having mounted solar panels on the roof. Uh, then you've still got, you know, can you can you remove the panels in a hurricane? Can I repossess the panels if the customer stops paying? There's a lot of issues. Uh, but Really, to, so it's just minimizing that fully loaded cost of the unit deployed in the field. Uh, the logistics and supply chain. So this is kind of where we get to this discussion around, you know, here's your core components, just LEDs, bases, batteries, steel. This, these are basically all the basic components. That what makes sense, just mathematically, to at what point are you buying the components and shipping them? Where are you integrating them? And this is kind of where it all came up to. You have sort of four different channels. You have your LEDs coming straight out of China, being shipped directly up to Haiti to be integrated at the assembly facility for deployment. The lighting kits, the base wiring, and the plugs, those are integrated in China, shipped from China down to the final uh, integration before deployment. Home kits and the battery, again, acquired in China integrated in China, shipped from China to Haiti for integration here. And then you've got the, the uh, generating stations. Components are all shipped to Haiti. Um, the steel gets fabricated in Haiti, integrating these into generating units and then integrating them with the rest of the equipment just before the plug. But this was economically the most efficient way to acquire, to minimize the fully loaded cost of Um, scaling. In terms of new deployment, this is relevant because for us, the first six units, we bought fully complete units out of Long Island. That was huge. We had no ability to do any assembly work in Haiti anyway. You had to start with something, and the actually gave us six fully complete units. For the next nine, I actually advocated for assembling in Haiti because I'm like, look, it, don't make me start at ground zero. Don't just sort of give me my 15 units and then leave me while I'm stuck trying to figure out how to put these things together. So they did it's sort of 75% complete units. They did the hard part. A lot of the stuff we're not repeating, like the trailer itself and the racking system we're not repeating. So they did the hard stuff uh, in Long Island, shipped it to us, and then we'll do the partial 
will have final assembly of a partially complete units in Haiti, and that will set us up to have enough experience that will step into commercial fabrication. The, uh, right now, we have a very we have a we're co-located um, the assembly facility is co-located with another steel fabrication business, um, so we have enough space to do the, about 10 units a month, 10,000 square feet shared space. We're working with USAID and uh, looking at, at what it's going to take to do the larger scale assembly facility. Something that we want to be able to do about 25 units at a time, 100 units a month. We're looking at working on about 10 units at a time. We need a lot of storage space because we're buying panels and batteries and container load at a time. Um, so for each 25 units, you need to have space for over 2,000 home kits, 150 panels, 100 deep cycle batteries and then 25 containers and racking systems. It's a fairly large amount of space required to get this much work done. Um, and it's a challenge and it takes training and it takes being on the ground, but it also takes setting up procedures in place so you don't have to be there going forward. Uh, there we go. So the, basically the production plan, we've got the staging the units, the base containers and the racking system, you install the pitch, the basic fixtures, which means you're dropping in the batteries, the basic wood that holds certain things in place, you're installing the wiring of the panels, there's a quality check process, and then the unit's ready for deployment. Uh, the budget, we have basically a three-month timeline that we've put together that's before USAID right now. It's about a $395,000 project to get the full assembly facility uh, complete, ranging from sort of developing all the management protocols, start the procurement processes, um, you know, getting the site and everything. So we're looking at a three-month process, about $400,000 to get this home. Once we have it done, Manufacturing facility that doesn't do anything is not of any value. That's part of our discussion with USAID on the assembly facility. They've talked to us, you know, we really want to fund this assembly facility. And we're like, great. But if you're not going to buy any units, there's no point. You know, I'm not going to have an assembly facility that doesn't make anything. So you need to have a market. And that's sort of where, you know, the rest of the model is so important. Um, our sales and funding can come out of organic growth. And we talked a lot about this yesterday, this organic funding concept. Once you've got those first units, the grant dollars that we get just simply kick out, kickstart this cycle. The grant dollars fund one unit, the revenue generated off that unit is monetized, the monetized that revenue generated through the monetization is funded to use to purchase an additional unit. Get you another unit deployed. So you just got the grant dollars, just kickstart this cycle. And you keep going and going. In addition to that, uh, the expectation is that when you guys launch projects in Africa, well, they, the first ones will be supplied from Haiti. So there's you know, that's another important market for us. We've got a number of other grants that we're still looking at, uh, large NGOs with funding to supply electricity. You know, energy is a huge issue. A lot of NGOs are looking for some sustainable way to get their stuff in the ground. Um, there's, you know, USAID is looking at this. We have a lot of discussions that are kind of starting with disaster release organizations. Um, the US military is actually interested in this as a peacekeeping device, peace through democratization of energy access. R radical concept, but, but they're like, this is what works in Afghanistan. When you democratize access to energy, you have um, the Taliban has less ability to come into a village. So it's that's what this all Electrons, concept. not guns. It's, it's who would have thought? Um, and then after that, we still got the large lenders that we're looking at. You know, the IADB, World Bank, OPEC, as well as the private equity groups. And the small NGO as well who may be interested in financing a unit for their school or orphanage to make it self-sustaining. So that's. So all of this is just, the whole thing is really designed to be scalable. We're starting small in each region and growing. Um, at the same, it has high, even if it's small numbers though, it has an incredibly enormous impact. But <coughs> it's the 
designed to be replicable, so we can use the same thing over and over again um, and fully scalable. So it's crazy to be able to have this project where you're like, yeah, I can do six, no problem. And those six, actually, once they're in the field, they're self-sustaining. As long as the guys are paying their bills, that means you've got money to pay the field tech to go out and, want, and monitor it and fix it. They're automatic, they're cash positive from out of the gate. The, um, and then you can just simply scale from there. And there's no real changes to anything as you scale up. It's truly scalable. <coughs> Um, and it's fully replicable. You know, the same concept, the same principles can be applied anywhere with adjustments based on the cultural issues. Now, this is something that works in Haiti, but there's need to be aspects of it will need to be modified for the community. Um, issues of the time and money. I think that's all I've got. Yeah. Um, we defer discussion for many of the conference here and we should rather take a minute break now that I can do the do the Q and A. So the right. That presentation is awesome. Um, a couple other things just so you know we are looking at some the biggest technical modification we're looking at for the whole thing is actually a uh, meter and deadbeat switch. So we're working with a company that's got a very very cost effective device that you know, uses SMS technology to give us the GPS coordinates of the device, <laughs> the amount of power it's generating, um, and allows us to turn it off if they don't make their payment. So they'll call us and they will say, broken, it's broken, and I'll say, oh, well, did you make your deposit? And they'll say, not yet. And I'll say, well, they fixed this issue. Do you have a lot of late payments in the That is for the main I have a very Haitian yeah, kind of style, and they're all the sort of the yeah. first three weeks. Yeah. I think I've got to remind you, but a lot of things are going to change in town. They're going to have to actually take more of those. I know. I think I've got to change in town. They're going to have to actually take more of those. I know. I think I've got to change in the good one comes to the time, please. And then they say the Can we get one conversation going at a time, please? Who wants the floor? So basically, the system is a pager. So you basically request a message from somebody. Yeah, it sends it. It just sends it. Yeah. Hello? Yeah, I can't. Everyone's the same. I cannot hear the conversation that's going on between you guys. So. Quickly summarize the last question that was. Yeah, we were talking just about the technology, what what that meter uses, um, and what it runs on is just simple SMS technology. So it's not, you know, it's not it's not any kind of satellite system. It's just your very very basic lowest technology cell phone communication yeah. text. Okay. But that does mean that it would need to be placed in an area with cell phone access. Uh, yeah. <coughs> but for yeah, a, right. and how clearly can you send the SMS? How clearly can you load the, the status on the GPS mission system? I'm sorry? How clearly can you say this is SMS? That means it's a free one. Yeah, um, I don't know that I don't know that one yet. We're, we're, probably still, um, we're, we're actually still talking to the company that's uh, designed it. But in terms of cell phone access, actually, you know, even throughout, throughout most of the, third, the developing countries, Nobody's putting in landlines, right? It's all no, cell phone that. There are, but there are still places. areas of South Sudan that don't have yeah. cell phone access. <laughs> 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 yeah. So as far as the, okay. the payment Peter, system, is it? Uh, your question. Yes. The, as far as the payment system, do you, do you have people paying uh, by phone, or do you have people paying by cash, or how how does it actually happen? Does well, someone come by and pick it up, or? Uh, in terms of the home customers, go to the. The central station, and right now give the gen, give the operator their 50 Haitian dollars. Okay. Um, this summer we're going to be setting each of those stations up as a mobile money station, so customers can actually pay their bill with mobile money, and we'll set up each operator so they can pay their bill to us with mobile money, and that will that will streamline all kinds of stuff for us. Cool. Uh, other questions for Paul? So, so, Paul, have you thought about how we scale it across different deployment versus when you talk about scaling within one area? Right? Is there a way we can take advantage of the knowledge that you 
going from A to the same way. We're building mass manufacturing. You know, we want to build it to defeat the number of air there versus building one in the mission. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that just becomes a strategic location, right? So like in Haiti, there are the manufacturing facility is basically located in Port-au-Prince. I can get to everywhere in Haiti in a day from Port-au-Prince. So if you were, wherever you were going, basically you can set up your assembly facility so you're within a reasonable vicinity of where you think you're deploying. You know, if you're in South Sudan or wherever, you're, you're going to be reasonably close to where your stuff is. Okay. So I'm thinking, right, if we're going to be playing Cameroons in Nigeria, how we take, take advantage of the, the bulk sort of purchasing power? And that you do just by working with Serum. Because from, from our end, we're already buying bulk out of wherever, right? So if Serum is also buying bulk for three different countries instead of just one. Also lower your cost, too. It, it just helps everybody, yeah. right? If we all do it alone, it's... So you put in an order for a 1,000 panels, and you want 300 to Haiti, you need 400 to Nigeria, and whatever, 200, 500, whatever to Cameroon, or it's a split ship. Yeah. But that split shipment goes from the manufacturer of the panels, it's not handled up. Correct. And from a logistics standpoint, and from a logistics and money transfer point, it all goes through us. But from a, you're like, okay, well this one, you know, the ship, the shipping company is sending one to Cameroon, and the And the assembly is going to happen in different countries, though. Correct. The assembly is per country. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Which might be country specific depending on the whole concept of trailer. Maybe in Cameroon we got trucks we can move on back up. We don't need trailers. We move them. Well, we won't have trailers anymore. Okay. They will all be trucks. They'll all be either customized trailers, either trailers that really just might as well be a truck because it just sits on it. Yeah, trailer doesn't work. Yeah, you could probably get a truck that could take two of them. Oh, yeah. yeah. I have no doubt. They're, they're everywhere. Yeah. Well, you do have to figure out the handling problems of not having the wheels on. Uh, we've actually, that, that issue is solved because of the change in the racking system. Once we remove the steel racking system as an integrated part of it, um, now with, even with the batteries, you know, even with the four, uh, even with the four station batteries in it, you know, if you have four or six people, you can lift it up and carry it. Really? Those, those station batteries are like 150 pounds each. Okay. Yeah, pretty expensive. But at 150 pounds each, that's 600 pounds in total. And at, at four people, three engines. That's easy. <laughs> so you're saying like the on-site assembly, you can disassemble it, carry it over a big boulder, reassemble it on the other side? You wouldn't even need to. You don't assemble it. But basically when you've got, uh, what I think you're going to end up with, and keep in mind this is still in process, is basically, a, Think of a coffin, right? And somebody dies, and you're like, got six pallbearers going along. Michelle hates the word coffin. But, but that's what you're looking at. So you've got this device, and the electronics are all in there. It's all wired up. You don't have to take anything apart. But you're left with this box, and you're walking to wherever it needs to go. And then, then you've got the racking system comes, comes you know, and then, then they go back and they get the racking system, and they set up the racking system. You can always take the body out if you need to like it. <laughs> <laughs> if it's too much, you can take those batteries out and then it's easy. Right? Yeah. Okay. Some stronger. A couple more patients. I hate that. I'm going to get up first. Go ahead. And then I'll pass I was just uh, wondering, I'm trying to think back to your slide in your previous presentation in which you were talking about, uh, I think it was the finance model, but you, you had some estimating metrics there in terms of uh, how many units, how many uh, uh, trailblazers you would, or solar, I'm sorry, sunblazers. Sun 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 you would need uh, for a million people. If your goal is to roll out to a million people, are you assuming four people per family or per six? six? In, in, in Haiti, it's about six. So that how, is that six, six, so six to eight. eight. So how many units did you calculate for your million? I'd, I'd have to redo the Well, I can tell you, it's about, uh, the old number was uh, about 4,500 for 40 battery packs per uh, trailer, so about half of that. That'd be about 2,400. I'm sorry. I'll try to do worse next time. <laughs> 
So given your business model and knowledge of E, does it make sense to piggyback a little bit on the idea from Pollock in India of situating several services there at that community kiosk, that vendor? That kiosk is a, you want to take this one? <laughs> um, the kiosk is run by somebody who knows how to successfully run a business. Yeah. Okay, the problem with that is, then that means that the kiosk is run by somebody who makes money. Right. And we have actually struggled when we've given the unit to somebody who is a business person because they are better off than the community that needs to bring them $6 a month. And they say, why should we give Nanny money? He's got money. So Nanny was ending up just supporting, he was making his lease payment. But he was paying for customers who weren't paying him. And we didn't find out about it initially. Um, he's like, the whole neighborhood's talking about it, and this and that. We've had much better luck in the bandwidth of the scrapper, who's always been just looking for an opportunity and making their own way, and is somebody that has, is not richer than everybody else. Do these communities have two kiosks? Three kiosks? Right now, everyone's got one. Oh, yeah. But I say think they, they, that's true from like the operator selection process, but from the honor rating standpoint, <coughs> when you've got that guy who is the scrappy guy, and he's just so grateful for the opportunity, his livelihood is tied to that unit. He makes it work. But when he's making it work, you can give him more stuff. So yes. now he becomes the guy selling the power adapters as well. Or not, or, or somebody else is the guy. Water. Or, you know, somebody else, uh, it, it, they're very entrepreneurial. So, you know, Andre's got a generator and everything's cool. And all of a sudden, you know, his cousin is like, dude, I'm going to go to Porter Prince, buy a bunch of 12 old things, and come back and sell them to people. You know, it's. Well, another way of spinning the narrative would be not going to the existing entrepreneur who's you know, selling things to fish in a small pond, would be the Vietnamese interpretation of it. That's how they make their write-up. But finding a new scrappy entrepreneur who establishes himself or herself with the power station, and then you have developing around that power station two or three smaller entrepreneurs or a new small entrepreneur with the water filtration, the power adapter, <coughs> I mean, can, can one entrepreneur even do all those things at once? You know, it, yeah. Maybe it doesn't make a yeah. lot of sense to just split it up. And it probably depends on the country, the culture, the economy. Exactly. And, <laughs> and in our culture in North America, we say, by and large, Walmart's OK. And there are plenty of people who don't like Walmart. But the culture overall has said, it's great to have one entrepreneur who undercuts the cost of all the others, and we will support Walmart. But in other cultures, that may be a taboo thing because you want to equitize. Unfortunately, um, Walmart's proven that, that as they move into those markets, their model continues to be preferred. Exactly. Which is exactly. criminal as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> but, but it's reality. But it's reality. But that's the reality. Yeah. And it's not Walmart telling the broader culture, this is how it is. It's yeah. the broader culture saying, oh, that's actually what we would like. Yes, convenience. Better price, bright lights. Yeah, I think but it's going to be a different answer in Haiti. In mm -hmm. Haiti, it's going to be much more entrepreneurial, sort of what I think. And we um, we didn't mention this either because the external power outlet has not been added in. But it was in the concept when we did the first deployment that there would be a power plug for uh, the residual power. Every operator on their application has to give us a business plan for what they're going to do with that extra power. So the best, they all say ice. <laughs> the best one we ever heard was Honoré, you know, our hero of the day. And we're like, what are you going to do, Honoré, if we give the power plug? He goes, penguin glass. Penguin glass. All right, I'm picturing novelty glasses with little penguins wearing beanies and ice skates. And I'm like, Honoré, that is the stupidest thing I have ever heard. A, there are no tourists that are coming here. There's nobody's going to buy a glass from you. And if they're buying a glass, they sure don't want one from Haiti with a penguin on it. And then Michelle's like, ice, penguin glass. Glass is ice. <laughs> <laughs> and the brand is penguin ice. Yeah. So. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> to 
two questions. One is on the new black box, there's a USB outlet, and then below that there's another outlet. That, that secondary outlet is only for these boxes because oh. there's a small trickle charger in there that allows me to charge up at home. Okay. The, the regular battery boxes don't have a new trickle charger. And the USB out voltage output is? 5 volts or something. Whatever, whatever the standard. The standard. So for cell phone charging off. Second question is, on your group of 10 that you're having distribute soon, what is your estimated cost per trailer coming in? Um, these ones will come in at just over, these ones come in at 12, I think, and then the next ones after that will should be down to 10. That's just the trailer? No. Is that included? That's, 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 right. that's, that's fully loaded. That's the whole catch, right? That's that's fully loaded. 12. With the, with the 83? Yeah, the 83, those 83 home kits are costing me about 40 bucks a pop. And another, it's another 15 to 20 for the lighting, for the lighting kit. And then the technology, the base station, we've, uh, the base station complements are down to about $6,000, just south, south of that. Or so in mass volume, say, you know, we're making them for South Sudan, for Nigeria, for Cameroon, for Kenya, wherever. Are you got a target goal on production line of these? Once we, well, from a cost standpoint, once we hit about ten thousand dollars a unit in cost, that doesn't include labor and stuff for for a for final assembly. Okay. But the key drivers are the cost of the components. Right. And once we, once we get it down, there's a certain point where there's no more money on the table to get. Yeah. You know, we yeah. talked to Canadian Solar, and they're like, look. It, I get you down to 80 cents a watt, that's it. If I start selling it for less than that, I'm losing money. Wow. And, and deck of batteries, we're talking to the guys like, look, I can get you down to probably, you know, 287, 285, if you're like our biggest distributor around. Um, but after that, there's no more money on the table. And you're just going to go through that over and over again. So I, I'm trying to think here of what, what the delivered cost is assembled and everything, whether it's assembled in Haiti or hands on, you know, including labor and all of the other ancillary no. things. But the, the number I use in Haiti for budgeting purposes when we do the USAID application right. is fifteen thousand okay. dollars. And that that's high. But that's that's fully loaded, all transportation, all labor, right. um, certain amount of corporate overhead right. and avoided profitability and um, six months of maintenance. So that's sort of that tends to be the number that we work out. Actually, no, I think that's two years worth of maintenance. So it's a fully loaded two year maintenance scale. Okay, and then uh, if we're looking to do this in parts of the world where the inverters are not, the inverter manufacturers, the various manufacturers don't have a presence, how are we going to handle a warranty for inverters? They don't have Whatever price. components you have on there that are being yeah. warrantied by the manufacturers. Okay. Yeah. And if the manufacturers don't have a presence in the... Most of them don't. Okay. Like when we're in Haiti and stuff, these guys aren't there. Right. They're, they're, they're there now because we just imported a bunch of their stuff. Right, but they're physically closer to America than... So, I mean, I'm just well, thinking they're all coming out of China. 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 Do you guys, you guys handle the warranty, right? It's not, it's not a manufacturer warranty. Well, it? we have a wrap, right? Because it's essentially our unit. So it's, it's my unit. I'm going to send a tech out there and it's always going to work. Uh, the components are all warranted by the manufacturers, and if a component breaks, it goes back to the manufacturer and they send me another one. And so, like with the, in terms of Africa and stuff, most of the stuff's coming out of China. Mm -hmm. We're buying loads of it, so if I have a bad battery, I've got a thousand batteries sitting in my warehouse. We send it out, call the manufacturer, and deal with them that way. So, every, once we're at scale, once you're actually assembling these things in country, You've got the components in inventory to deal with with real time warranty issues, and you've got the relationship with the supplier to deal with. One of, the, one of the challenges with Africa and Chinese warranties is that the Chinese are not generally providing warranties on imported goods, just because. This is my experience in Cameroon, and maybe you guys know differently in other countries, but but because there's no competition to provide warranties, because nobody else is providing a warranty on stuff, then they don't. Whereas in America, we got warranty. All manufacturers are providing warranties on all kinds of appliances, and so the, anybody who's going to import in has got to meet market expectations. So, as we develop this model, it's one thing you got to think about: is that even if we're buying in bulk or bringing it in, 
and establishing with those suppliers that they're going to warrant uh, but to, to these other markets. They're warranting to me, right? That's sort of the value, part of the value of Sterling. If we're buying for three different countries, right, and you're buying millions and millions of dollars worth of stuff from whomever, right. and you say, I want a warranty, even though it's going into Africa, they say, no problem. It's just confirming that. Yeah. Well, we actually have already, because okay. with Wagon, we actually had this issue. Yeah, yeah like we usually don't warrant things because we don't know how it's going to be treated when it gets there. Right. We don't want to be responsible for it. But, they, they but because of our relationship with you, yeah. you, 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 you can just pass through the It's an, it is definitely an issue, yeah. but it's one of those things that we actually know we've had the conversations, and it's something that, that when we're at the right scale or we have just strategically aligned uh, companies, we can get what we need. So, as a seller, how do you cover your product liability? As a seller, how do I cover my product liability? I, I, I can't tell you what would blow up or go wrong, but how are you insured? Are you insured for sun blazers catching fire and doing bad things, or home kits sending off sparks and lighting huts on the, fire? Uh, <laughs> you can sure have a lead battery. The the, battery. the, the um, catch is in Haiti. There's the product liability law is not a huge issue. Um, the bigger issue for us is disposal issues. That's actually my bigger yeah. concern. You yeah. get a trailer that tips over or something bad happens. And that's just a company responsibility issue. We own the unit and we own all the units. We always will. And if we see us, if we see us, we will know where our kits are. And if, if your kit went missing, somebody's going to be on you to go get that kit. And you know, if your kit is going to be sitting in the river somewhere, it's going to have your name on it because you were dumb enough to write your name on it before you threw it River. It's got a barcode on it. It's got a barcode on it. So, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> we'll be tracking this stuff. We'll be taking care of the waste streams. Um, you know, it's, it's not a huge business. You know, Dan brings up an stuff. important point here. And although, and, and I've had experience with this in, in China, didn't have any product liability that they do now, but they did. And there's a, there's, there's a personal responsibility, there's an ethical thing that goes on here. And then there's a public relations nightmare. When someone is injured by your product, independent of liability laws and attorneys and all that, when you have the community running around saying that so-and-so's hut burned down because their battery had caught on fire, whether or not it's true, all right, or un, you know, unbelievably someone was electrocuted because they were improperly maintaining the, the big unit and the big batteries just hit them, you know, one of the proactive things is to have in place your teams what they're going to do and how they're going to handle that and, 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 and what kind of compensation is expected by the party of, who feels they're at fault and you know my experience in China was you know there was a certain threshold of money that basically was expected from the manufacturer to compensate the family for the death of the loved one caused by your, your product and you know you had to pony up because that was the best way to Besides doing all the other good things that you do, pay for funeral costs. Yeah, it's not, it's not been on the radar screen yeah. at this stage. But as, the as an overall expansion of the product, and we are talking about 200 units or 1,000 units, right. silly things happen that are so, not anyone's fault, per se. Right. So have you, had, have you not had any problems with, uh, say, the home wiring kits, you know, breaking anybody? Electrocuting anybody? Yeah. Oh, anything like that. So no, like, uh, 12 volts. So no, it's not so much electrocuting because it's 12 volts, yeah. but like, you know, it could catch fire, it could, you know, they break or anything like that. It, it, it's 12 volt DC. I mean, there's just not a lot to go. If there's not a lot to go wrong, your biggest risk is leakage of the battery. The only uh, danger would be, you know, a burn from a flash from an arc that you can get just because there's lots so of stuff. Your kerosene lamp is. It's dangerous. More dangerous. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <coughs> right. So but they're not going to blame the kerosene lamp. True. Yeah. We'll put, we'll put uh, as a mitigating step, we actually in the USAID grant have added in a, a clinic on site during the assembly process in case something gets cut or burned. 
um, you know, basic first aid and a, and a person to administer it in, you know, on site every day just to keep a good reputation. And I, I know he's right. There's a dollar amount associated with unfortunate events. And yeah. we'll just do the right thing. And we don't know what that is. But at a certain level, there's, there is a level of, you know, it's like, Somebody's walking around with a cell phone and they trip and they gouge their eye out. What are you like, dude? Whose fault is that? You drop a home kit on your foot, it breaks. That's not my problem. There's a McDonald's coffee uh, thing. But there's, there's just hot coffee. You know, the, the <laughs> home kits are no more, more dangerous than yeah. your laptop computer. There's nothing there. The but the base station, it, you're like, there's no moving part. There are stabilizers for the most part. That's your right. Head. <laughs> but you hit your head on it. Um, I mean, yeah, if you're if you're sitting on the batteries and you decide to pee exactly right on the batteries, you might have a problem. Or you know, I mean, it's it was a it's, continuous stream. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's like come on, it's only so. You know, yeah, you take your crowbar and you go. I'm going to short out the batteries and see what happens. Yeah. But there's not a lot. There's a there's a there's another cultural philosophy here that goes with along these lines, and that is uh, okay. I'm trying to come up with a good analogy, but it's the sense of if you had never come here and had ever brought this, the problem wouldn't have happened. So you're the foreigner, and you you've introduced this. I'm not the foreigner. I'm not there. Yeah, and you've got that advantage. But if if they feel the foreigner is involved. Known as the deep pockets, but there's also the uh, okay. You, my experience is you where we think of product liability, or, or we think of liability of a, of a you're, you're going up a stairway. It's a it's in a developing country. The steps are uneven. A foreigner trips and falls and feels that they should pursue the architect, the manufacturer, everyone who made that stairway, as we could do here in the West. Say here in America, but in the West. We would pursue those who were involved in making the stairway. That's not the standard. The, 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 the local philosophy is if you had never come here, you never would have tripped. Right. So you have no case. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> you uh, getting back to a question for you guys, though. The unknown and the cost. Uh, Paul, Paul can give you a quote for n number of units if you were in my RFP. Ask for a quote. Uh, but then, what is it going to cost you to get that unit here mm -hmm. in terms of shipping and customs and duties, mm -hmm. taxes? Related? Do you have any feel at all for what the situation is getting the equipment through? If it's coming through as components, which is how our, our solar power systems are coming in as components, then the the taxes are, the import duties are reasonable. Like what? I don't know exactly, but it's not a, a major not impediment. Not 30%? No. 10%? Something more. Yeah, no, it's maybe closer to 30%. It's not 100%. It's not, it's not ridiculous. I know that within our, within the model that, that we've got and the components that, that, that REI is, that brings in, it, it, it works out financially just fine. First units, we took kind of a bath on it because of combo. And right, and, and we, and there's the potential for that for us because they they REA brings in solar panels as silicone materials, not as not as solar panels, and so they are able to you know lower the, the taxes because it's not a completed they don't consider it a completed solar panel they consider it the silicone materials. So you would want to get this thing in pieces. Yes, I think that would be. So as you perfect the knockdown kit, that's what we look yeah. for. Perfect the knockdown kit, yeah. then you know. Then. I think there's another possibility just to throw it out there on the table, and that is if you've got USAID support for the project, the embassy will import it to be free. Yeah, for the first units. But you're on, you're on your own. Yeah. And that's actually one of the things we hate that we're dealing with. Our taxes going forward, but. As a new business, and Haiti wants to attract businesses, we can get duty-free tariff. We can get duty-free clearance on basically any components that we list on our application. So those are those are big deals. If you can't, the 
first units that we were working with, the original tariff was like 40% completed units. And I was like, dude, I'm, and I talked to the guys, I'm not even going to ship them in if I have to pay 40% for it. And we were able to kind of work through customs and get a, a half decent rate on them. But, um, you know, you can't live, develop, it's one of the problems with developing countries. You're sitting there going, well, we're going to have 100% tariff on everything. And you're like, well, then you won't have anything. Sorry. Because you don't make batteries here, you don't make solar panels here, you don't make anything here. And if you, you know, so if you want something, you can't have it if you're going to charge me 100% tariff. Mm -hmm. Just reality. So, in terms of sizing the unit, <coughs> designing 1.5 giga, did it come from some consideration of density of homes or how, how it, it came done? from the the concept was we, the original sizing was we wanted to be able to charge every battery, all 40 batteries, um, once a day. And we wanted to have one day's worth of power storage so that you know, the, if, the, if it was cloudy for a day, you could actually still charge all 40 batteries off the station batteries. Okay. So any learning from that in terms of the actual deployment? Grossly the oversized. Grossly oversized. <laughs> we could have gotten with much smaller units. Um, but at the same time, what we did was, okay, well, that's fantastic because from a cost standpoint, once you've done a certain amount of work, it's not a big deal to add a couple more solar panels. So cutting a couple solar panels from the thing is going to save you 500 bucks, big deal. I can add, I can double the number of kits and the economics get a lot better. Um, the bigger issue is actually storage. The usage is not high enough yet. We actually, well, we're losing too much power. Just it's not getting captured. The battery, station batteries are full. Not enough people are coming in to get charged up. And that's why the plug is becoming so critical. Because the operators, it's like watching a stream of clean water go by and not, and not being allowed to, and holding a cup. Mm -hmm. I've got a cup, I've got the water going by, and I can't dip my cup in the water to use it. But on the, on the first units, it's, it's much better to be like that than to have shorter. Yeah. So, I mean, just to establish the credibility. That was like Ray's thing. He's like, yeah. these can't fail. You cannot put these in the field and have the customer unhappy with the product. And that was the mission. So for doing a, a piloting program in another country, would you, uh, again, recommend with 40 units, or would you say 60 units, per, or I should say kits per unit to begin with uh, in, well, in the piloting saw, stage? You, know? you saw my uh, proposed fundraising profile mm -hmm. the other day. That was based on that the 10 units seemed to me to be a comfortable number for the company to have on the ground to establish the credibility of the business. And these guys are getting 15, but they already got the credibility with the first six and the knowledge that more were coming. So I think 10 is a nice number. But what I'm, what I'm actually saying is, uh, for one unit, would you have, would you recommend in a piloting phase, again, to only have, be conservative and have 40 home battery packs, or would you recommend instead 60 or 80? Oh, I care. I got my thoughts on it, but I'll give up the judge Go for the 80. Go for the 80 to begin with, in the piloting well, stage. Well, it's a choice. I mean, you have a choice. I think I would go for the 80. What I would do um, the same as we've done here uh, that has worked really well, the ancillary plug I want to add on later with a responsible operator. I don't think I'm going to show up in the beginning with the plug available. First learn how to manage your power with your customers. And I would start with 80. Um, first get that under control, you know, and then we can turn on your switch so that you can do a side business well, as well because I think it's too much to do all of the You were just asking whether to do and I'm more, actually I would take one step back. I actually like starting with 40 because I want to see how many of these kits are going to disappear. And, mm -hmm. you know, is the operator going to collect his money from the customers? And I'm like, all right, okay, three months into it, you've been collecting your money, you've paid your lease, let me give you 40. And you've got also now a lot of people, you're going to have a bunch of pent up demand. So now I'm going to give you 40 more. That's a really good idea. And then, yeah. You know, I mean, this is Apple, Gillette, and everybody else with their marketing scheme. They don't, they don't show the whole product first. So in two years, there's a better product. 
by four years out, you've got another better product. We don't have to think in terms of programmed obsolescence, but since you've got two models in hand, you can give one and you can give something better in a short while. Keep building enthusiasm. That's right.